Okay, thank you very much. I'm trying to squash an incredible number of different ideas into 20 slides, in fact, slightly more than 20 slides, so forgive me. Um, I will probably talk fast, I will probably shout, I will also probably mutter, please say if you can't hear me. Um, I do straddle both worlds in the sense that I'm a kind of HIV expert. I work for AIDSMAP.com, is my big day job. Um, I'm a European campaigner. Um, I'm also in the process of um, setting up and getting funding for um, a pan-European prep campaigning group, which is the thing you see on the bottom right of my slide. So I'm tremendously occupied with HIV, but I am trained as a psychotherapist. I trained at the Sheeran Centre for Body Psychotherapy. Um, uh, and I'm only, I'm not really practicing at the moment. Um, and that's partially because of the huge amount of other work I do. Um, and it's partially in the spirit of self-disclosure, but not too much self-disclosure, that I decided it was time to take time out and become a client again myself. Um, because... Um, of um, some of the issues I'm probably going to talk about in this presentation. Um, and also in that spirit, you may know, because I'm pretty public about it, that I've had HIV myself since September 85 and therefore have walked that talk, as it were. Um, okay, so the, the sex without fear, question mark. Um, I presume the title, I'm just this is a presumption, there was a very good article on the implications of PrEP in New York magazine that came out a few years back. I'm, I kind of made an assumption that the suggested title may have come from that. And of course the answer is, um, there's no such thing as sex without fear. Um, it, Tim basically talked about this in his presentation and this slide almost kind of compresses his presentation into one schema. Um, sex is fearful because we lose ourselves in orgasm, become our child selves. Um, that can lead to um, things like um, compulsion and being lost. It can also be lead to wonderful things like surrender and transcendence. Um, sex can be both harmful but convey great feelings of safety um, and being loved. Um, it can confront us with our need for self-esteem um, and also confront us with rejection. And of course, um, it also can be profoundly ego dystonic if you have um, a sexuality that you have been brought up to regard as aberrant. Um, but. Okay, this is the world that I grew up in in the pre-AIDS era um, because I'm lucky enough to be that old as some of the rest of you are um, and I remember the discourses around sex and sexuality that we were having when I was a gay switchboard um, volunteer in the early 80s and a young, young chap dealing with coming out yeah. myself. Um, and there was, you know, the debate was all around. It wasn't around health so much. It was a bit about STIs, but it was all about how to have a good gay life, how to, how to, how, how to have relationships as a gay man. Um, and I mean, primarily, but also, uh, I mean, there, there was a more uh, also cross fertilization between um, the trans and lesbian and gay worlds in those days, from what I remember. Maybe I lived in a particular kind of milieu. Um, but I think when HIV, when the emergency of HIV came along, it to some extent froze that debate. And one of my, the sort of thesis of this is that now we are, have things against HIV that finally work. That's reopening uh, a terrific area of discourse and debate um, that kind of got frozen when the HIV emergency came along. And this, incidentally, represents um, a merging of the worlds of psychotherapy, social theory, and sexual health um, in ways that, are, that I think are very useful because they have been very separate. So it's no coincidence that the UK AIDS Awareness public campaign, which some of you may remember, featured an iceberg because I feel that HIV came along, the emergency of HIV came along as a trauma that almost froze the gay community into a state of fear, and this, which, made it, uh, which made people's ways of dealing with 
being sexual as a gay community quite um, limited and quite static. Um, immediately, and, and nobody is to blame for this. You know, it was an emergency. People were dying all over the place. It was incredibly frightening. But as a result, I think, um, it, it, it developed a kind of uh, ideology in the gay community that the AIDS emergency is the one we have to deal with above all else. And that in turn, I think, um, led to a prioritis, prioritization of physical health and survival um, over a mental health and quality of life. Now, that's a big thing to assert. Um, but there is some sort of evidence for this. Um, I think the, earlier the earliest community responses and the earliest responses to HIV were, of course, responses from the gay community itself. They always are. Um, were um, uh, not um, rigid. Uh, they suggested various possibilities. They used humor a lot despite pervasive, pervasive fear. They were not prescriptive, imaginative, caring, defiant. Um, on the left is the first thing I could find which mentions the, um, um, the uh, idea of safer sex, and on the right is the leaflet that actually used the term for the first time. Um, and they were uh, drawn up by HIV activists, and um, I'm, I like the fact that, for instance, How to Have a Sex in an Epidemic, which was written by somebody who subsequently died, somebody who's very much alive and an HIV doctor, um, is their last sentence, is maybe our best defense against AIDS is affection, which almost summarizes some of what Tim was talking about in his presentation. But then, or and then, I've written, I think prevention then got codified. The social marketers got at it. Um, and they looked at things like campaigns against um, smoking and against, you know, and for wearing your seat belt and against drink driving, and they had a particular idea, and a lot of social theory got into this. And also, um, preventing HIV turned into using a condom. And I'll be frank about this. I think this was a mistake, a historic mistake. And I've thought so for sort of 15 years. Um, because I think it piled onto already traumatized, already struggling gay men, a huge weight of um, guilt, um, a, 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 a very rigid definition of what it is to be a good gay citizen. Um, and just look at the messages on these particular ones. And believe you me, I have not chosen in any way the worst. Um, you know, if you don't use a condom, you're stupid. Um, if you don't use a condom, this one on the top left, clearly directed at gay teenagers, you should hate yourself. Um, you know, using a condom means you are good, presumably. Then using one, not using one means you're bad. And this one directed at women, men who don't use condoms are pigs, you know. So, although I think the, there were the best of the t intentions behind this, and not all uh, prevention material was like this, a minority of it did emphasize pleasure and intimacy, but there was a lot of this around. And this paper at the top neatly summarizes the three main theories that I saw in a lot of um, social and psychological research about why gay men didn't use condoms, which was prioritized as the big problem. Um, um, condom fatigue, or did they, were they just sort of trying and trying and trying and trying and eventually they sort of, they gave up, which begs a lot of questions about the experience of using condoms. Um, Self-esteem, are they uh, not protecting themselves because they don't think they're worth it? And this wonderful thing about AIDS optimism, where actually being optimistic that you might survive was presented as a problem because you were more likely to not use condoms if you did. Um, uh, and one other thing that I think got very neglected in all this was not so much asking why gay men didn't use condoms because I think there are as many answers as there are reasons why people have sex, um, but I think one thing that got neglected was the physical difficulty of using them, including widespread experience of erectile dysfunction. Uh, and although there was a lot of research into this, it kind of got tabooed a bit. It was kind of not, um, I mean, I was actually at a presentation at the HIV conference in Mexico City where the 
paper underneath was presented. And I remember one doctor turning to another next to me and going, in that particular English dismissive way, like, you know, this is something that is, it is self-indulgent to research in the era of the AIDS emergency. So what actually happened? It didn't work. Um, this is my own slide, and anyone involved with Sigma usually kind of goes, mm -hmm, when I show this, because um, it's important to say that each year is a different group of people. Um, but this is the longest single bunch of gay men sex surveys, as far as I know, with the possible exception of one carol in America, anywhere in the world. Uh, and it stretches, as you can see, from 1983 to 2014, with gaps due to funding. Uh, and uh, basically, condom unprotected sex has consistently increased among gay men. So all that prevention work, all that social marketing it didn't work. But that doesn't mean gay men didn't try to do stuff. They did. What they did instead was that they tried to zero sort. Uh, and this graph on the left shows the sort of gap you see appearing um, is the gap between... Um, rising amounts of condomless sex in gay men, but falling amounts of serodiscordant condomless gay sex. This is in San Francisco, and it ends in 2011. Um, I've deliberately put the rainbow barred one. It's small because I could devote an entire half an hour presentation to that. It's a wonderful Australian presentation with a big database, and it details the incredibly detailed choices that some gay men had to make about the, the status or presumed status of their partners and the circumstances under which they would or would not use condoms. Um, and it, it faced gay men with a bewildering variety of choices. As a result, it didn't work. Um, and here are four slides. Um, France, England, Italy, Poland. Um, and they detail gay men uh, HIV prevalence, sorry, HIV diagnoses in gay men um, going up. Uh, they end in 2012, because I've got more to show you. Uh, and, they, and the one on the bottom right shows an extremely worrying situation in Central Europe of exponential rise in HIV. And this is occurring in some other countries of the world, like the Philippines, uh, China, right now. Um, so, PrEP came along. Um, PrEP has been around as a research subject since the mid-90s in monkeys and the early 2000s in humans. Um, and I could see from the start that if it worked, it could have enormous potential. And that's because um, the, with the comparison with <coughs> needle and syringe exchange in injecting drug users, which incidentally is probably the single most effective thing, that prevention method that was in HIV before PrEP came along, it's separated in time from the moment of risk. You don't have to use your works when you're already high. And that was always the problem with condoms. You were sexual, you were horny, you were disinhibited, you wanted the sex more than the condom. Right, with PrEP you can take a pill uh, in advance. But it was also tremendously confrontative because it meant that you intended to have unprotected sex. And this chap in the middle is actually still from a video that was immensely controversial because it featured a young gay man who was not at all apologetic about the fact that he was going to go out and quote unquote party. It is strongly hinted in some of the stills that he's on meth. Um, and then you cut back to him in his flat in the morning and said, I like to party, but I like to be safe. And so this is about taking care of your vul vulnerability and uh, not apologizing for your behaviors at the same time. Prep. But, but the studies showed that PrEP was about 44% effective at most until about 2011. And then these two came along, one after the other, a within a month of each other. Um, I feature the two leading scientists, Sheena McCormack and Jean-Pierre Pierre Molina from uh, France and England, in these two studies. And they both found the identical reduction in HIV um, infections of 86%. It was extraordinary, and I was very privileged also to be asked by Sheena to be co-chair of the PROUD study, so that's how I became Europe's Mr. Prep, which now dominates my life. Um, but these, these, these were historic studies. They didn't expect to find the reductions in HIV that they actually did. Everyone was astonished, and this, these were the studies that showed this shit works, basically. 
created a huge storm. There was a, a, an article appeared on a blog called Trivada Hors um, by uh, a gay uh, journalist who I won't name because he's since recounted, although it's up there. Um, and this created a huge opposition. Um, basically, he was saying, you know, the gay men shouldn't do this, they shouldn't give in to their slutiness. And immediately, almost immediately, a group of gay men sort of said, well, I'm a Truvada whore and I'm proud to be one. And this guy on the right actually sort of de designed his own T-shirt saying so, and this spurred the chap on the bottom left, Damon Jacobs, who's a psychotherapist working in New York City, um, to set up his own Prep Facts Facebook site. One of the stories of Prep has been the immense influence of social media. Face, um, Prep Facts, I checked the last time yesterday, it had 15,000 members. This is a huge forum on PrEP and has been probably the biggest single information resource for gay men, and it's entirely community-generated. Um, but now PrEP has become kind of mainstream, endorsed. Um, uh, the WHO recommended the bottom left. Our image is uh, New York's um, very much uh, public um, state in, not state endorsed, city endorsed uh, public health campaign, not just for gay men, there are heterosexual images in this too, um, including PrEP within um, a general package of staying safe from HIV. And the top right graph shows the expanding use of PrEP in the US is probably about 150,000 people now on it. Unfortunately, this is very much not the case in Europe, um, where apart from France and now Norway, um, no country has endorsed uh, PrEP, as, uh, has made PrEP available through the public health system. But this is all about the money now. And we are campaigning very hard to make sure that it does happen. And if you look at that picture, you'll see me in the blue T-shirt at the bottom right. So, but something extraordinary also happened, which was that because of the lack of PrEP availability, um, a few um, activists in the gay community actually started spreading information about how to get it online because you can, you can buy it on the net. Um, there's generic prep made by Indian and other uh, country manufacturers that you can get and in England there is a loophole that you can use it for personal use as long as you don't buy more than 30 days of drug. Um, and this chap, Greg Owen, um, is a remarkable example of a kind of uh, a flawed, uh, vulnerable young gay man, young, um, he'd be probably not flattered to be described as such, but um, who himself just was outraged about the lack of PrEP. His story is that he, he, he caught HIV just too late. He literally went along to Dean Street because he wanted to take PrEP and found that he'd recently caught HIV, and I think he was fired with a mission to save other gay men from the fate he'd himself encountered. Um, and, the start, uh, and I think this, is, this in itself turned into a sort of social movement. And some of the doctors actually endorsed this. They said, well, we are medically obliged. If guys are, are taking this, then we are obliged to help make sure that they use it wisely, that they get their HIV and STI checkups, and that they don't get side effects. Okay. PrEP is not the only answer. You saw I said it was an answer number, number two. Answer number one is the positive side of things. This has been working quietly in the background for years and is the fact that if you take HIV treatment and you um, become virally undetectable, you are no longer infectious. But this has been trim even more contentious as a thing to say publicly than PrEP. Um, and the first group of scientists, doctors who said it, were uh, a bunch of Swiss doctors who wanted to say it because people were getting prosecuted for exposing partners to HIV when they were, in fact, not exposed. This very much put the cat against the, among the pigeons. Um, and more, it can greatly reduce the pool of infectiousness. This is a big, very sciencey slide, and we'll carry on with that. But what happened is that much more recently, a similar kind of advocacy movement has sprung up around treatment as prevention. This hunky chap with no shame on his chest is a guy called Bruce Richman, um, who again is one of these sorts of like highly motivated single person campaigns. Um, and really his campaign, which is called U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable, bit of a mouthful. Um, a slogan which I have to 
say I suggested, um, which has only been going for about a year, has already created a lot of interest and a lot of heat, I have to say, in the gay community, um, because um, it's trying to, it's saying, um, look, if you're HIV positive and you are virally undetectable, you need to know this piece of information, and that's all it's saying. But it's very interesting as to how the fight against HIV has made certain bits of information a bit taboo. When the scientific study that really confirmed this came along, which is the one I have at the top left from AIDS Map, it was by far the biggest news, news story that AIDS Map has ever featured, far more than the PrEP studies. So what has happened recently? Chris hinted at this. Since the beginning of the year, we have seen tumbling rates of HIV diagnosis among gay men, not just in London clinics, this is just from Dean Street, but in HIV clinics throughout the UK. 35 to 40% fewer diagnoses now than there were a year ago. We don't know why this is happening. It may be that we've reached the tipping point with treatment as prevention, but the timing suggests that PrEP had a very important role to play. This mirrors the fall in HIV diagnosis that happened, started to happen, several years back in San Francisco, which is way ahead of us in terms of the availability of these programs. I'm not going to go, I'm running out of time. So I will s say, yes, sure, at the same time as these things happened, lots of other things happened too, which were less welcome. There were exponential rises in, there, and continue to be in other STIs. Uh, we've talked about Chem6 and we haven't talked about the um, impact uh, of things like poor mental health and suicide and gay men. These are still our reality, and these are the things that were maybe there in the background. And I would say, to summarize it, the freedom from fear of HIV doesn't necessarily mean freedom from fear of being HIV positive, both in terms of general background stress uh, of being a minority, but also in terms of HIV continuing to be a feared status, a feared and stigmatized status. Um, and I think this is due to a lot of reasons. The traumatic impact of HIV on the older generation, that, is n that guy is, it's no coincidence I put him up there, he's my ex-partner, um, so it's affected me. Um, the thing I'm used to from the early gay lib that of conservative gay men who think that there is a social contract, that if gay men behave badly, then we'll rock the boat and society will suddenly turn against us, as if they weren't against us enough already. Um, and a whole bunch of quotes. I haven't got time to get through these, but I will do the guy on the top right, because he's a, a classic bad gay. Um, <laughs> he's Paul Morris. Um, who runs Treasure Island Media, which for years was doing bayback, bay, gay bareback forum when it was, you know, just the most countercultural thing you could possibly do. And when he welcomed PrEP and said, well, actually, I think this makes sex hotter, I thought, that's it. We've reached the sang Shangri La of HIV prevention because what you need is something that makes you, that, that it's makes, uh, prevents you getting HIV, but which makes sex better. Um, and that's it. I'm not going to go into this. I'll just highlight this as, as, as a very significant essay, I think. This appeared um, uh, um, a few months back. Um, it's a sobering document, but it's very good because it brings together a whole number of the themes I've been talking about, about why, what the issues we have to left to deal with if we are reaching the end of HIV. Thank you. I've overrun slightly.